For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idly in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon, and at about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily rage. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have, been born, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. You did not agree with me, did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this, to, the, to this last the same as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you so envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O God. Have you ever dreamed about finding out that you had a wealthy relative that left you a tremendous inheritance? Somebody who left you enough money to make your life so much more easy. Possibly enough money to make you fabulously wealthy. I have to admit that I have also given that some thought and dreamt about that. I admit that I've watched the news and read stories about children of movie stars and, and uh, music giants. And, and like you, I often see the entitlement that comes from that lifestyle, from being raised in that, in that lifestyle. A life of luxury that these children did not earn without any appreciation of the difficulties of life without money. I often think to myself as I see these kinds of stories unfold, if I were to come into that kind of money, I would live a life with humility that comes from knowing what it's like to live without that kind of money. They cannot know that kind of humility because they've never had to live without money. Did you know that there are some very wealthy people in the world today who have committed to leave the vast bulk of their wealth to charities? not to pass it on as an inheritance to their children. There's a philanthropic movement called the Giving Pledge. It was started by Bill and uh, Melinda Gates and by uh, Warren Buffett. And it's a pledge that uh, the, those who make it dedicate their personal or family wealth to charitable organizations. Like I said, Bill and uh, Melinda Gates have made this pledge pledging to give much of their wealth to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as well as that, uh, the, the giving pledge that they went into and started with Warren Buffett. Their children will receive only a small percentage of their fortune. Warren Buffett will be leaving his daughters a little bit more, but again, the bulk of his net worth will not be given to his children, but to the philanthropic work that he is interested in. Then we have a person like Chuck Finney, the co-founder of Duty Free Shopping Group. You know that, that uh, store in all the airports that you can go buy duty free uh, items? His worth, net worth was once calculated around $8 billion. And he has already been working to give much, almost all of his, uh, his resources to charity 
He is reportedly worth today only about $2 million, and his children will not be receiving any of his income, any of his uh, any inheritance. And when they were interviewed, they reportedly are okay with this, saying that his actions have helped them become normal people, to live like normal people. It's pretty shocking, isn't it? Let me ask, how would you feel if that were you? If your parents were making that pledge, leaving you little or nothing at all compared to what they had? Now, I'm not asking for that right answer that you would give as good Christians, which would say, no, I, that money needs to go elsewhere. It's easy for us when we don't have it to say that. But think for a moment, if you really truly had very wealthy parents, without giving that right Christian answer, how would you feel if your parents told you that you won't be receiving any of the inheritance? Would you be all right if something like that were to happen to you? It's estimated that uh, over 65% of millennials expect some kind of inheritance. They expect that their parents or grandparents are going to leave them something. As a chaplain at the hospital, there was never any greater drama in, the, in, in each of the rooms than when a fight would erupt over who, what, come, what becomes of the inheritance. Siblings would lose their minds in the room with the patient when inheritance would be brought up. I got a call one day to go and help calm a difficult situation. The family matriarch was actively passing away. There when I got to the room I found three of the children who were getting into a heated argument over who would get what. The mother, their mother was still alive on the bed and they were fighting about who gets what in that house. By the time I got there, they had begun to push each other, yelling and threatening lawyers and retribution against each other. It was an awful, awful mess. And again, that poor mother was there on the bed alive. I ushered everybody out of the room and told the children they had to leave. And, the S and security came and escorted them out. As per, per the hospital policy, they were not allowed back in. They were so focused on what they should get that they lost the opportunity to spend the last few moments of their mother's life with her. Their anger and their rage and their greed had consumed them, and they lost out on that which, which was most important. Today we're going to take a look at inheritance, at expectations, from time to time I know that the message that gets preached can be difficult, that I sometimes preach a message that's hard for some to take and to absorb. Today is possibly one of those days. This could be one of those messages. If you've ever been upset over anything that I've said in a sermon, anything that I've ever preached about, please know that you're likely to be upset today, and I will not be offended if you left right now. As a matter of fact, I won't even know if you leave. There's nobody watching. We'll be looking at today's passage and we'll be asking that serious question about what our expectations are. What is it that we think we should have? What is it that we demand? What is it that we think we deserve? And we're going to be challenging those expectations just a little bit. Let us begin though with prayer. Gracious God, as we open your word, and study what it is we find there. We pray that your spirit would open our hearts and minds to even the most difficult of subjects, that we would hear you clearly in what you're telling us today, that we would see you very well, and in hearing you and seeing you, that we would be, we would be more inclined to, to follow you. I pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ and through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. When I ask the five basic questions, what is it that we need to know, why do we need to know it, what is it we need to do, why do we need to do it, and how do I help us remember it? That first question can sometimes be that difficult part of what it is that we need to know. That could be difficult. Today, what we need to know is that deep down, each of us 
have a sense of entitlement. Some of us fight it a little better than others, but each of us feel entitled that somehow we have earned all that we have. Or even worse, we feel that we have earned or are earning more than we have, that we should get more, that we're entitled to more. The scriptures gives a great example of this in the parable of the prodigal son. We know the younger son goes to his father and demands his inheritance and he takes off and squanders his money while the older brother stays and works for the father. And this comes to a head after the younger son returns and is welcomed back with open arms. The older brother is incensed, angry, having spent all that time there with his father all that was left should be his. He should have gotten more than he got already, and all of that should be coming to him. He was entitled to what was there, to what was his father's. And like the older brother, we too fall into the trap that somehow we have earned all that we have. Somehow we have, we're entitled to what we have and more. We feel we should have more, that we have earned more or are working on earning more. And yet, we fail to remember and to recognize that all we have comes from God. Our jobs, our education, our cars, our kids, the respect that we demand, our church, our worship structure and church programs all come from from God. Not only are all of these gifts from God, but our ability to own these things or to have these things are a direct result of where you were born and when you were born. Something that is completely 100% out of our control. Somebody who has great intelligence might say, hey, my own intelligence gave me what I've got. I was able to go to college and get a good degree and do good work. I've earned this and yet fail to recognize that they have, number one, intelligence that was given to them by God. That they were born into a time and a place where that intelligence can be put to good use as a gift from God begs the question, how many very intelligent people have been born into very poor circumstances, awful situations, and could not use that because they could not get to a place to put it to use? You did not decide your blessing and your position. You were blessed with it. It was given to you. All things truly come from God. The reason you and I are called to be stewards is that all that we have, all that we own, and all that we care for has been given to us for a short period of time. We only have it for a little bit of time, and then it goes back to God. In the span of our life, which measures a short time, mere 80 years on average, is a short time to have all that we have. Eventually, all of that goes back to God. It has been given to us right here and now for us to manage and care for. If we take a look at Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30, we'll find there the story of the talents of the master who was going away and called three of his servants in and gave each of his servants a large sum of money. A talent... A single talent is worth roughly 15 years of labor. The wages of 15 years doing labor work. To the first servant, he gives five talents, or 75 years worth of labor's wages. To the second, he gives three talents. Did I get that right? No, he gave two talents. And to the third, he gave a single talent. God gave, or the master gave the, the servants these talents and expected that they would put them to good use. Upon his return, he called his servants in and he called in that money that he gave them. They were to return what he had given. But not only did he require that they give the money that was given to them back, 
he also required interest. He demanded that they give interest. The first servant gave back five talents. On the five talents he made, he doubled the money that the master gave him. So did the second servant. The ser third servant, though, took that talent and buried it. It did no good. It didn't shine. It didn't go to work and do anything positive. And when the master came back, that servant dug up that money and gave it back to the uh, master's disgust. So it is with our Heavenly Father. What we are given is not ours for eternity. What we have goes back to God. But not only does God expect that what we have goes back to God, but God expects that there be interest on what we give back, that we have somehow grown what God has given us and blessed us with. We have taken and have grown what we've been given and blessed. Here's our reality. Our reality as Christians is that our life is full of, uh, of, of difficulty. The life of a Christian is a life of growth and sanctification. From that moment we accept God into our lives, Christ's forgiveness and the Spirit takes up residence within us, we begin our path towards sanctification. What that means is we grow. We grow from who we had been. We grow from our nature what is natural to us, and to God's nature, something that is not natural to us. And that path toward our true spiritual self is our path of growth and sanctification. It's difficult. It's not easy work. Every week, pastors and prophets all over the world call us towards transformation. This is never easy work. It's always hard and it's always difficult. I was told very early on that, that life is difficult and painful and that we are called to grow. And you know you're growing if life is painful because pain, uh, growth is pain. And you know you're not growing when you're comfortable. And if you're not growing, then you're dying. We're called to move. We're called to grow. And every week pastors and prophets are putting out that call knowing that we're calling you into pain, knowing that this is difficult and not easy work to do. For most of us, this is extremely difficult work that we're called to do. For we all resist changing our deeply entrenched ideas and values that are ours, our firmly founded positions that somehow we deserve what we have. That somehow all of this is ours and we've earned it. It's difficult for us to fight that entrenched idea that all of this is ours to control when the reality is that it is not. Scriptures today tells us that the laborers who went out and worked all day long felt it was unfair for the landowner to pay those people who came late in the day and only worked an hour and paid them the same wage. And they cried foul. They were incensed that they didn't get more for working in the heat of the day and all day long. And it's interesting the way that the landowner called his manager to pay the last workers first to show everybody that they were all getting the same money. Now I know this is a poor business model. One that would reward, likely reward idleness. That would encourage it. That people would stand around and wait until the end of the day just so they could work an hour and get paid a full day's wages. Some might argue that this kind of business model closely resembles welfare. Now, would we dare accuse God of giving out welfare? You bet I would. I say that because you and I did not earn our salvation. The wages of our work, the wages of all that we've done, the payment that's due to us for all that we've done is punishment. But God is the biggest welfare agent in history, generously giving away what is His. But I digress. Yes, this business model does, not, uh, does seem to encourage laziness, but the point is clear. God gave a fair wage to the workers who spent the whole day 
working, as well as to those who came and only worked an hour, a small portion of the day. What this means for us is that it does not matter how long we've been here, how long we have been working, God gives to everyone a same portion. We are wrong whenever we demand more because we've been here longer, because we've been working longer, because we've been in ministry longer. Just as those early workers were wrong, we too are wrong if we think that for some reason we should have more, that we deserve more, that this is somehow ours. It is so hard for us to get our mind around this idea that, that we didn't earn anything that has all been given to us. And we're just called to be good stewards of what's been given to us for a short period of time. That's, that's hard for us to get our minds around. Because we've been taught our entire lives that if you work hard, you get to earn more. We're taught at church that if you come and you put in the time, this is your place. And yet it's really not ours, it's God. These are paradigms that, that we are turning on their head, that God, even 2,000 years ago, were turning on the head and shifting the paradigm for even them 2,000 years ago, as he does for us today. What we have isn't ours. We shouldn't be holding on to it, ruling it with an iron fist, saying, this is ours, we've earned this, we're holding on to it. We're called to find a way to share, to invite others in. Oddly, and what's not part of the, the, the parable today, but oddly, we are called to be going out now and inviting people into the vineyard to work. And we're to be joyful that people, no matter at what time of the day they come in to work, get a full day's wage. We're to be grateful that what we have will be passed on to somebody else. And that somebody else will be coming in and taking over for us, just as we came in for somebody else and took over and carried on the work that I was doing. We didn't and are not doing the same work that was done at Geneva 50 years ago. We are not doing the same work that was done in the church 100 years ago. Every generation comes in and changes the work that's being done, changes the, 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 the direction and the dynamic of what is ministry and considered ministry. They change the style of worship and the music that is played and sung. And for us to hold on to it and say this is ours is not only wrong, it's inappropriate. We're merely stewards, and stewards can't claim ownership. They can only maintain and grow. When we claim ownership and hold on to it, we lose interest, we lose value, and what we have shrinks. But when we become good stewards, we maintain and care for that which we've been given. And we find that we are able to grow. Our interest grows. Our dividends grow. And when God comes back and says, I want what I've given you, we can give back what God gave us. Plus, we can say, and here's how it grew. Here's the interest in what we had. The church is a better place. The world is a better place. We did good with what you gave us. We recognized it wasn't ours to hold on to, but it was yours. And we help to make sure that it carried on. Sometimes the more difficult the, the, the growth and the challenge that we have, the more difficult the change that we're called into, the sweeter the satisfaction and reward. When we stop resisting the call of change that we've been called into, and we give into that change, we find that the work is so much sweeter, the reward is so much better, and we are so much more at peace. The world is changing around us. When we've been talking about this for seven years, how crazy the world is around us, and never has that been more true than in the past seven months. And sadly, we're, there's no end in sight to where we are. We are likely to be here six, eight, nine more months before we start to find a way to get back to some normalcy. The world is crazy. 
It is different. We've never lived through this. We thought what we were dealing with five years ago was difficult. We'd never been through that. And now we find ourselves in this situation. And while the world has been in all of those situations before, we haven't. We don't know what that's like. And yet somehow we're called to be good stewards, even in times like this. My point is simple. Right now the world is turned on its ear. And it is far easier for us to make changes to our belief system and to how we do business in times of great upheaval than it is when things are going great and well. That firm hold we had on what is ours has been shaken over the past six months. What was ours in that, that church building and in our worship, we've lost that control. And that's a good thing. The question now is, how do we be stewards of what we have? And how do we grow what it is we have? What is it that God is doing and calling us to do today? I pray that this week you will find a way to evaluate the different parts of your life that you hold on to and ask that question, how am I being stewards of what I have, of this? And how am I called to let go of the control that I demand? If we're honest with ourselves, there's almost no part of our lives that we don't hold on to as ours. If we're honest with ourselves, we can change how we act and we can be stewards of that rather than holders of that. May this be a week where your reflection will reveal to you how we, how you, and I can be better stewards. Thanks be to God, now and forevermore. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, you, you call us into difficult growth. You challenge us in ways that we're not always very comfortable with, calling us to be something different than we are. Sometimes those changes are not too difficult. They're easy to do, just minor adjustments. So sometimes, God, it is a top to bottom, front to back change. Ownership and stewardship, God, run far deeper than just than what we've been able to even discuss today. It permeates every part of our being and our lives. Help us, God, to understand the difference between ownership and stewardship. Help us to move into the direction of, of being the stewards of what we've been given and letting go of what we think we own. And help us, God, to give back to you that control that we might be more productive in the work you've called us to, and that we might truly change to become the people you are changing us to become. I pray that for us, for our world today, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we finish our service today, let us finish 